So welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run great organizations. Today, we're excited to be joined by Kirsten Sibelia of Datner Architects about how to build firm health and vitality, a vocal advocate for the value of design and the importance of creating resilient and sustainable urban density. Kirsten Sibelia is managing principal at Danner Architects, a New York City firm with a long history of improving and sustaining communities and the urban environment through design. She leads the firm's strategic planning, marketing, business development, and communication efforts, and manages also special projects. With that, thank you very much for joining us today, Kirsten, and also to uh, my weekly guest here and co-host, Chris Morgan. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Cool. So I think we can start off with a very interesting quote from a recent interview you did with Madam Architect, um, where you say, sometimes I think that my mission is to prove that a mid-sized firm can survive. What pressures do you see in the 20 to 200 person scale office that uh, keep firm survival in question? Like what, what's, what prompts that quote actually? I usually think of mid-sized firms as say 50 to 250, but I know there's, there's, there's always a lot of uh, debate and different ways to look at it. But I think there's a certain, there's a certain size firm that if you want to be able to um, keep doing ever more interesting projects, um, there are a few things that feel like threats. Um, one of them is the mega firms that seem destined to gobble us all up if we're not careful and um, have just a really different um, way of operating, of selling their services. And it's, it's hard to compete oftentimes. Um, their ability to offer this wide range of services under this supposedly cohesive umbrella um, is, um, is somewhat suspect to me, but often um, seems appealing to, um, to some clients. And so that's a real challenge. And um, so how do we make our fees um, appropriate for the service level that we wanna provide so that we can compensate our staff in, in a way that's respectful and meaningful um, and, um, and that we can keep getting the types of commissions that we want. The other big aspect of mid-sized firm, if you want to be a mid-sized firm that does that continues, is leadership transition. And I think we've all seen a number of firms that were fabulous mid-sized firms that didn't invest the time and planning that it takes, um, or maybe weren't interested in trying to, um, to really develop a next generation and another generation of leaders. Um, and they end up folding, which is, you know, sad to me. So both those fronts are um, areas that I try to be very proactive about. Kirsten, we often hear firm leaders talking about a fear of growing too fast, but from your background in business development and marketing and expanding business opportunities, I wonder what your thinking is on the risk of growing too slow. Sure, there's a perfect rate. I think what's most important is to be real, to have a real understanding about aligning your, your projections with, with what's actually happening. And if you were not expecting that you were growing so fast or you were expecting to grow faster and you're not, to make sure that you're course correcting in order to, um, in order to not misstep because it, things happen very quickly. And um, it's really important with the margins that we all operate under that you're realistic and, and closely monitoring where you actually are against what your plan was. Um, I think there is a certain kind of fish in the fishbowl um, scenario where you know, your, your aspirations, your appetite does, does help you to, to reach that. 
And so I think most of us, probably most of your audience does have those aspirations. So not being able to, to grow and progress um, could be a concern, but I don't think growth for growth's sake is, is a, a value that, that, that works for me, that works for us. And in our, our conversation, I kind of, in the intro, I kind of started off by talking a little bit about how we were going to discuss like this idea of firm health and vitality. Um, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Uh, what, what do you mean when you say, you know, firm or what, what, how does that definition break out for you? You know, for us here, what um, some of the things that we really look for um, as, as, as our ideal for the firm is having a real variety of work. Our, ge our geographical base is more concentrated than a lot of firms. We really are the tri-state area. Most of our projects we can actually take the subway to. We really, we really love to, to, know, to know our sites, to be very familiar with them, to have easy access to them, you know, to see our projects progress. But we love the diversity of programs and the diversity of scale. And that, that overlay brings such a richness and vitality to the practice. And so even if maybe your focus area is affordable housing or healthcare, you're seeing projects every day around you that are different types of projects that are still urban projects that are serving the communities, but in a different way. And especially in cities, so many projects really are mixed use or um, have these complex adjacencies that makes an awareness of other program types really valuable. And then the other part of it is really making sure that we're having, um, that we have interesting design opportunities, that we're really, that we have clients that share our, our, our vision and respect us so that we can really do our best work. And that really leads to professional development and satisfaction for our employees, which is really, really important to us. And we want um, everyone to feel like they're learning, they're growing, they, they feel engaged um, and can see their, that they're valued and that their contributions are, are acknowledged and eventually manifested there. And, you know, bricks and mortar and um, creating a new school for a community, um, a new park for, um, for an area of town. And you know it's that it's that kind of vitality that 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 brings us that brings us back to um, when we're at, looking at projects on the boards and that excitement and those aspirations. Kirsten, as firms grow, um, like what you've seen in your own experience, what kind of new awareness do you find that leaders need to step? sort of step into the responsibility of having that might not have come naturally and then may not have, you know, come to that awareness at a certain scale, but as it grows, it's this new skill set or this new mindset that leaders have to acquire somehow. A lot of firms, um, and we're certainly one of them have wrestled with, um, wanting to really be hands-on partners. And um, most of my partners really, you know, ex exhibit that, um, you know, well-rounded project architect is just, you know, kind of all of our model. And so as you progress through your career and as you're running a firm, um, you can't still be um, changing the light bulbs and moving the boxes. Um, you can't be doing all the invoicing, you know, whatever it is, you, you have to figure out how to let go of certain things. And it, that can be really difficult for people. At the same time, you don't want to add in too many systems too soon. So kind of finding that balance, finding who you can, who you can delegate to, who you can empower to step up, but then also still staying in touch with enough things that really, um, bring you joy that connect you to, to why, why you chose this fabulous industry to be a part of um, so that you're not just you know, paper pushing, whatever the equivalent of that is now digitally. What, what, what's the right metaphor for that today? Paper pushing, what, what, what do you say? Slack notification, I don't know, the Slack notification, <laughs> I don't know what it would be. It's like uh, 
commenting i don't know i don't know i mean it, it probably would be comments would probably be like right adding mm-hmm. comments in Miro, adding comments or i don't know it's something yeah, along those lines. Yeah. yeah yeah um you know you want to get beyond that so um so i think that's that's really you know that's the big that i think is oftentimes the big um growing pain is figuring out how to let go of something and maybe, maybe to kind of ground it in your own experiences, um, you know, for you, context has changed from your career. It started in, in kind of business development, marketing, and now you're managing direct or managing principal, sorry. Um, and you oversee a lot more than just that, um, especially with the strategic planning piece. How, how have you feel like you've grown it's, it, it, throughout that transition? Was that did that come natural to you to kind of move into that role? Um, or maybe put another way, it's like something we talked a little bit about, but a little bit about is how someone who starts in marketing kind of ends up there. So here, be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. I think that to be successful in marketing in our industry, you have to um, really understand enough about practice so that you're, um, you're able to communicate the, the uh, potential of the services that your firm could provide and be able to really tell the stories of the projects that you are working on or have completed. It gives you a really, really interesting insight into practice and into the life cycle of projects. It also gives you a real respect for the importance of the individuals who are working on those projects that really make those projects. And also the importance of those relationships with the clients too. Um, No matter how good you are at marketing, there's nothing like, uh, you know, repeat clients, references, word of mouth, referrals, all of that has to be in the mix. Um, So I think that um, understanding, understanding that and getting just such a, great overview of, of project life cycle from a marketing perspective and a respect for bringing in the work really helps you to move up through firms. I think there used to be a lot more of a disconnect between, you know, marketing was kind of off in a corner and practice was somewhere else. And I think that um, during my career, that's really changed. Um, it's become much more integrated. I think marketing is no longer a dirty word. I think most People coming up are really excited to get to learn about the pursuit process and be involved in that. Um, and so, um, bringing that, bringing that then to my position as as a as a principal, as the managing principal, really, um, I'm also able to capitalize on some of the skills that I learned, which is about um, being being strategic, having a long term plan, but being able to develop the tactics and implement them to get there. And it's the same thing you need to do if there's a market you want to develop, if it's a, you know, big pursuit you're working on, um, or if it's something about, you know, firm evolution and strategic planning, um, or, you know, really any aspect of the business. You have to be able to operate at those two different levels. Denner has a lot of impressive metrics for projects on its website. Like for example, 8,300 units of a th- of 100% affordable housing, or 58 million annual riders, use Datner designed upgraded or upgraded MTA stations. What other internal or external metrics do you track to gauge success as a firm? It's really nice that you guys spend time on our website. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about our website and how do we manifest the impact that we're so proud of that we have. Internally, um, you know, we look at, we, look, we certainly look at things like that. We're really proud. We're really proud of awards. We love getting awards. That's certainly a big thing to think about every year. Um, you know, other KPI that we look at are um, maybe more traditional things like um, net multiplier and, and, and how, how does each project do um, in relation to that um, revenue per seat, um, we look at um, net to gross um, year to year. Um, we also look at um, number number of we look at value of invoices. 
Um, and we kind of have buckets for that. So, you know, are we busy because we have a thousand small projects or because we have a hundred medium sized projects or can one? Of course, it's never just one or another, but that is, it, you know, helps us to understand um, the mix of projects that we're working on too. We try to look at things a lot of different ways. What I think is really important is that there's enough consistency that we're, you know, say quarterly or um, annually, uh, it's different rhythm for different things. We're looking at the same stats year over year. So you can start to gauge some trends. Um, if you're just looking at them once, it doesn't really, you know, make as much sense. Um, since we're on, on a little bit on the topic of uh, marketing through websites, which I, I'm very personally uh, uh, fascinated and interested by, um, I'd love to talk a little bit about what inspired a bit the positioning of focusing on these kind of very, like, you know, for those that aren't, aren't aware or just listening in, you know, Dadner's website, when you go to it, um, it basically has a, a scrolling list of projects by the a key metric, essentially, right? Um, how did that, where did that inspiration come from and how, how did you view it strategically to approach it that way? We worked with a great consultant for our website, um, a company called For Office Use Only. And um, we knew we needed to redo the website. It's um, in, in the old days, it used to be working on a monograph. These days, it's a website that I feel is a real opportunity to, to really um, dig deep, think big. Um, who do you want to be? That has to be grounded in who are you now? How do you how do you want to how do you want to talk to clients? What kind of clients do you want to have? What kind of projects do you want to be working on? What kind of new recruits are you trying to draw in? How do you peel the, the um, how do you peel back the curtain a little bit to show inside of what's happening in the office? Um, so one of the big steps for, for us was hiring the right consultant to work with. Um, and then also um, I put together a task force within the office that represented people working in different sectors and at different levels of the company too, so that we had a lot of different opinions and insights and reference points. And we spent a lot of time in the programming phase talking about um, what was important to all of us, what had drawn us here, um, what excited us the most about the projects we were working on. And we kept going back to the impact and that we, that we felt like our work has had over these decades and that, that really we felt distinguished us from, there's so many, there's so many great firms. There's so many great firms out there. Um, and so we really felt like that was what we needed to help to communicate. So the ticker, as we call it, um, was, was a big part of that. And trying to come up with something to really kind of quantify some of the impact that we've had at some of the, we work on these huge urban projects that are, have such a long, have a, such a long tail to them. And um, it is really interesting. Um, we get really geeky about some of these things. Um, you know, just how deep is the energy um, is the energy reduction on certain on a certain building? Just how much salt is in that salt shed? You know, all these things are the kind are the things that help I think reveal the kind of people we are and just how much we care about our work. Yeah, I also think it's fascinating because there's a lot of conversations in the industry around, you know, um, time and value. And, you know, the, the, the conversation typically breaks down like people not, want, you know, firms don't want to bill for time anymore, right? They just, they want to bill for value. And what I really find fascinating about the website is it's one of the first instances that I've seen where it's really started to try to communicate value through a different way. And it, it, it's like in a very strategic way by, by saying like, here is an external outcome out of this project that we did, not an internal or like a, let's say almost like a, a, in, in tech, we use this word called vanity metric, which is typically mm. a metric that um, let's say visitors on our website. Great. But did that lead to like new anything, right? Um, just tracking the number of, of visitors is, is not really that important. It's important what, you know, the next step. So in what, what I love is that these um, 
a vanity metric in architecture websites today might be the square footage of the project because it really doesn't, it just talks about the complexity. Yeah, we did a big project, but that's also captured in the image. So of, of the work itself. So what else is there, right? And I really, I, I just want to commend you. It's, I don't know if it's a really a question or anything, but I, I'm just, I, I think maybe the question here might be like, have you seen any other impact from that by repositioning your projects based off of those, using that as a lead in, as opposed to like, you know, um, what might've been historically like, yeah, we do a commercial project. Yes, it's by this square footage. Yes, it's in this city. I think, um, you know, most of, most of the clients that we work with are, um, are, are experienced clients. So, um, you know, where we're starting the conversation in terms of, in terms of sales with them is in a different place. I think where we saw the impact more was that we were really trying to, um, embolden our, our brand and better represent our aspirations and, you know, building on that, the historic legacy that we're so proud of. I mean, the firm's, you know, was founded in the sixties. Richard Dattner is still a partner here. I mean, it's, you know, that's wonderful, but where, where are we going and how are we, how are we making sure that we're being, um, that, that we're representing um, the optimism the passion, um, the, the, the impact that we really feel like our work has. And, and so I think that that's been well received by both our existing clients and new clients. It's also, I think, really helped us in terms of recruiting, which is a big thing for us. It also, the website is not just this external tool either. You know, it's, it's part of how it's part of how your employees get to know you when they, when they join, right? They've looked at it when they've been applying and it, it's it's the front door now for everyone. And so um, it just, it sets, the, it sets the tone in a way that was really important for us. And um, it, um, we started it, we, well, I'm glad we had a few meetings before the pandemic. Um, we rolled it out during the pandemic and we did feel a little hesitant, you know, were we, was some of this just too, um, I don't know, what, was, was it just too much about us? Was it, you know, were we being sensitive enough? And then we realized that, we, you know, we had to be, we had to be confident in who we were. And this was a really tough moment in time that we were all going through. But the commitment that we have as a firm to do these mission-driven projects to help invest in our cities and bring design um, to help um, improve people's lives was ever more important. And we had to be, um, we, there was no reason to be shy about that. You know, just, just to, to even focus this also a little bit on like the impact it could have internally, do you... Do you find them now with new projects? Because ultimately you have to now consider, you know, every new project will go on the website, right? Because that, that's kind of how it feeds back into it. Um, do you find now that in, in your process for, find, for going after work, are you trying to identify what those, what's the ticker going to look like essentially? Like what is the, that kind of like takeaway oh, from, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't think we're as I don't think we're as, as clinical about it as that. You know, when we look at what we're going to go after. You know, we're looking for a project we're going to be proud of. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's the biggest go no go criteria, right? Um, then we try to remind ourselves that we need to make money, and so you know we have to be able to come up with a fee that's going to support support the effort. Um, but um, I, you know, I don't. I definitely don't think we just want to add to the numbers that we have up there. You know what I mean? Conceptually, I think we're looking for, you know, how else can we, can we make an impact? So we definitely want to provide even more units of affordable housing because it's so much need, but how else can this, um, this, this really great intersection of, of, of commitment, of interest, of expertise, of passion, um, where, where else can we, can we be of service with our design skills? 
want to start talking about uh, recruiting and developing talent at Tetner. Uh, there's two things I want to bring into the mix that I think are really interesting. So one is you have this uh, friendship with Marjan Pearson, who is uh, a, also a great friend of Monographs and has spoken, uh, done three talks uh, with Monograph in total, one of which was marketing for talent with Linda Wallach and herself, uh, Marjan Pearson. And so that's one context. But another context I think is really interesting is section cut day, just to demonstrate on the tactical um, the, the tactical like prowess of, of Kirsten and Datner is the, the morning of section cut, we got a, a whole slew of Datner um, new jobs posted from Kirsten that morning. And you, you know, you'll believe it. Like we were really promoting that job board that day on section coat. So Dadner got a ton of attention because of that particular uh, strategic decision, you know? So that's just like a case in point of, I feel the, the broader context of marketing for recruiting um, we even got a comment right here. Marjan Pearson says, Kirsten is a terrific strategist. So that's one example, two examples. What are some other ideas or unique approaches that you take for marketing and developing and, and recruiting the talent base at Datner? Well, we are definitely hiring. We could use more talent. We have, we have, um, we now have 120 people in the office. So a little bit bigger than we've ever been before, which is really exciting, but we do have some open slots and um, we, we hold a high standard about the people that we bring in here. So, um, so recruiting is a really important thing. It, I see that there's almost no difference between marketing and recruiting. Um, and internal communications, which is why this kind of all fell very easily under my purview kind of early on, even as, as I um, took on more um, for the firm. And, you know, it is, it's about communicating value and, and opportunity. Um, we, um, we do, you know, kind of every, every, everything that you, that you need to do, and we try to, um, with a with a platform like yours, it's a really interesting opportunity to reach people, you know, that maybe we weren't reaching before. Um, you know, we do the career fairs, you know, we, we post jobs where we should, but we also try to really get out there and, and talk to people so that they know who we are. Because in the end, that's what it is, right? You know, maybe it's different if you're going to a mega firm, but if you're going to come work at Detner Architects, you're coming to a mid-sized firm, you're going to come work with someone who you, We've probably met. Um, we did a survey here recently and um, 35, 40% of people said that they came to the firm through a connection that they had here, which might be our literally our referral program, which we do um, um, have with a little bit of compensation for everyone here in the office. But all, sometimes it's it's less formal than that. And it's that I, you know, I served on a committee with someone, I heard someone at a talk, I met someone at a tour or at an event. All of those things are really, really important. But so is retention. And, and that's that um, that is um, a real passion of mine and trying to make sure that. We're, we're doing check-ins right now. We supplement our annual review process with six months later on the kind of off cycle, just check-ins that are more listening sessions that the partners do with employees to really make sure that everyone realizes how valued they are, that, that they have an opportunity to share what's going on for them, to make sure um, that they have another chance to check in on their and talk about their professional growth and development and their aspirations. Um, and these days, especially these pandemic days, just to really make sure everyone's doing okay, because um, a lot of us are struggling. A, a lot of us are struggling, and it's important that we understand that we're still we still think of ourselves as a small firm in that way that we're you know that we're a family. We really care about each and every individual, um, and um, so it's. 
it's all of these things. On the note of, of um, retention, which is, you know, sometimes it's a function of a lot of different things within, within an organization. I think um, how people ramp up at the beginning of, of starting out a company is also a function of that. Um, how has, and, and ramping up is, is, is often also a mix of like, what, what kind of infrastructure is in place to help train and nurture and, and kind of grow somebody along the way. How, in, in, in the context of, you know, where we've been in this kind of very remote first world now for about close to two years, um, how has Danner operationalized that piece, that knowledge sharing piece uh, and even remote working in the past two years. And what takeaways have you had from that experience that's gonna uh, influence moving forward? We, um, we have used, um, you know, we started using Microsoft Teams just before um, everything, the world changed. Um, and so that has, um, that has become our, um, our primary platform for communication. And we've tried to really um, push and pull that to get a lot out of it. Um, even in terms of, we do a lot of, uh, we have a Datner Academy, we do a lot of professional development. So being able to record those sessions to make them available, especially the evergreen content um, and really helping to share that then with new people refer back to it and, and try to make sure that we're, um, we're taking advantage of, um, of the development of that content. Um, because our work is highly technical, because we work on, on these large, complex urban projects and so many different types of projects, there is a real need um, to knowledge share and also an, an interest in that. Um, and for some people, they learn a lot better by just listening to something. Other people read, other people need to talk. And so we've also found when we have to keep, you know, there isn't just, you know, 120 people. We're all a little bit different. There is no, there's no one approach that's going to work. So we keep trying to find the right balance of, you know, how are we, you know, are we sharing this in enough of the right places? Are we sharing this in too many places? Can we simplify what's, you know, what's on the internet? What's it? And it's, um, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not sure we have it all figured out. I think it's all, it's going to continue to evolve too. We also, everyone is now here um, in the office one day a week. We're going to be going to two days a week in November. Um, plenty of people have been coming in more than that, but, you know, in terms of our kind of commitment to find a way to come back in the office more than we're working from elsewhere, we don't know exactly what the end game of that is, but we're trying to live comfortably in this hybrid world. Um, we did get everyone mobile workstations um, in the last year and a half, and so we have a real commitment to um, empower individuals and we're listening to how people feel like they they need to work they want to work they feel like they can be productive they feel like they can be engaged um, at the same time we know um, for our long-term vision that needs to include enough time in person what are your favorite outside of architecture reference points for sourcing new ideas that maybe you want to bring into running your organization or other kinds of ideas maybe that have to do with working with uh, team members, uh, taking on new ideas for projects. Where do you look outside of architecture? I, I, um, I probably should look outside of architecture more. I mean, I'm so so steeped in this world and this is you know where most of my most of my friends are in our industry and I have a great peer group within our industry. Um, I you know Harvard Business Review is is a great is a great source and I I do read a lot a lot um, from them and I so much of what they what they put on is about the service industry. Um, 
different service industries, but that the professional services there is a, a special, there's a special component there that really does help to relate. Um, so I so I do. I mean, I read a lot and I try to um, I try to share a lot. I do share a lot here within um, both my with my within the principals group with our studio directors, um, and we try to keep a real you know um, keep looking keep looking around. Um, but it certainly is architecture heavy. Do you have other sources that you think I should be um, looking at? Uh, well, you guys uh, have like, some great content, but it's also, you know, industry focused. It is, it is. I mean, but uh, like our whole playbook is really, it's very tech influenced, like, um, in the sense of like looking, um, at like how even buying decisions have changed drastically within the past five years, people, let, let even, let, let, if we were to talk about the context of monograph, let's say, right. Um, you know, people don't make purchasing decisions anymore necessarily through searching for solutions. It's all in, in, in architecture is actually very comfortable in this world of word of mouth, referral based, right? People are sharing monograph in Slack channels, in Twitter conversations, uh -huh. in Instagram, in other places that are not attributable even by tools today, right? You can't, I can't, I can't pull a report necessarily for you and say, hey, you know, this person came because of you know, on Slack, I can't, I, I, know, I don't know when someone shares this on Slack, right? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of what we, how we think of the world is really about community building and conversation starting. And I actually do think this is a, a really interesting point for architecture to maybe adopt is you have, as an example, let's say you're a firm focused specifically on hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, it would probably be really great to build a community around hospitality as a conversation and around leaders in hospitality to first, you, you get to learn so much about through that process, but you're also the person that's kind of bringing everyone, everyone together. And so what you're doing is also building trust. And mm -hmm. I think that is, a, those are really interesting new ways in which tools are now available to make that happen virtually there's new playbooks that can actually be kind of designed that uh, meet people where they're at, not necessarily, hey, you know, we're monitoring, we're trying to sell you this thing, like, in, you know, really, really uh, top down in a way. It, and I think that's that's kind of where we get our inspiration from is the companies that are doing re that really well in tech, um, like uh, companies like Drift, Gong, which are more like I mean, even just the implementation of tools is something that I could riff on for a very long time about the kind of cool tools that are available for firms to use um, on their website and sales processes and marketing. But yeah, it's, I, I think there's a wealth of, of which I, I sometimes think we should do more about actually is like, how do, how does monograph help educate too on, mm -hmm. on the tools that are out there that are about uh, marketing and business development and to kind of change the game. Um, but yeah, I'd say we're always looking elsewhere because um, that, that's also the nature of our business too. You're right. You're sort of this, uh, this bridge for some of us too, which is fabulous. Um, so I think um, it would be interesting to talk a little bit too about how you, you know, in, in architecture, you talked a little bit about the transitions and I, I, th I think we talked a little bit about it early on about how m marketing has also changed to the perception of marketing. Maybe this was also in previous to our the starting the webinar about the, the how marketing has changed over time from being a bad word in the industry to being something that's now like accepted. And I think the rise of the CMO in firm organizations is a good indicator of that, right? That's now it's become an executive level role. Um, how how has your experience been on that front of like being a change agent um, within within Datner, even within the industry? How what have you seen as like an effective vehicles that help to kind of educate people on the importance of of that strategically? I you know I do think that it has changed so much from those you know. You know, when I first started, there was a real resistance 
to the fact that we had to market services because I guess they all used to just go to the country club and get work or whatever. I don't know. Um, and these days, you know, the proposals that are put out are these, you know, volumes. It's 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 remarkable. It's not always probably the most effective way to actually select a firm, I would certainly say, but you have to really respect the effort that goes into it um, on the marketing team side. I think that there, there was, um, I think the, this, this unique set of skills that, that makes you a good marketer um, was enabled people like me um, to really become trusted advisors in, in our firms and be sought after um, for counsel on a, on a lot of bigger decisions. And I think for me, that was you know, a combination of, of those skills and that interest and spending a lot of time um, learning about the business and not just the firm I was at, but how the, how the larger business worked. Um, so that I could understand trends, like, you know, again, dating myself when Revit was really starting to become a conversation to make sure that I really understood how that was going to change the, 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 the workflow of developing a project and how, how it was going to change then staffing and deliverables and our technology needs. Um, you know, the design build, understanding, you know, what that meant and what the, what, how, how those contracts were going to affect um, both who we needed to consider as clients and how we needed to position ourselves. And so I think there were, there were changes that were happening in the industry and the skill sets that a lot of us had enabled us to be of um, greater and greater value. And fortunately, um, there were um, people in firms that were, were ready to, to receive that help, to accept that help. Um, I feel like there's also this really interesting thing that, um, that in some ways maybe is unfortunate that once you, it's not until you, you get the title, like I feel like I was working say at CMO level before I got the title, but once you get the title, people, um, people trust you even more, especially outside your, your organization, right? Who haven't bestowed that title on you. You just, you, it opens doors. It comes with a certain level of cachet. They, ex, they understand that you can, that you can operate at a certain level within the business and within the business environment. And I think that's true for, you know, partner for sure. Um, the kind of the best business development tool that I ever got was, being named a principal because for people to realize that I could really commit the firm, that I really spoke for the firm, um, enabled me to be a much more effective um, business developer. So it's this, um, uh, like most, most things to be, it's interrelated, it's synergistic, they build, reciprocally upon each other. It's not as, as clear kind of what was the, you know, what was the chicken and what was the egg. Um, and I, I love that um, as long as you keep making this forward momentum. And so I think it's, it's kind of all of these, at these different moments, the change that I've been able to, to help firms make, um, has been at a, at a higher level, depending on the position I'm starting in. We can start shifting over to Q&A as we have uh, several questions in here. What's in store in the next five years for Datner? Can you give us a glimpse of what kind of strategic plan is in place for the near future? We're moving our office early next year, which is really exciting. It's been a real soul searching in the middle of work from home to be planning a new physical space that is larger than your current space. Um, trying to really envision how do you wanna work and um, what kind of, you know, what's the right environment to foster the kind of culture that you're looking for. And um, we 
have had, um, we've had steady growth, continued growth. I've been here for a little bit over 10 years or twice as big as when I got here. Um, that's not our plan to continue um, at that rate, but um, you know, we see ourselves solidly as this mid-sized firm. We're building a space that will allow us to have 150 people or 120 people today. We like to continue to do more and more complex projects. We do like large projects. Um, and we are really um, interested in um, working together across the office to understand um, how practice can continue to evolve. We have a partners retreat next Friday. Um, that's the partners and the associate principals. And the theme for that is the future of our practice. Um, where we're really looking at all different areas of practice um, and just big sky thinking, you know, how, how do we think we can continue to evolve and do better and enjoy what we do better? Um, so I think that when we think about, you know, where we're at in the next um, three to five years, it's um, in this great, beautiful new office that's just a few blocks away. Um, but um, that it's, it's, um, it's us, you know, plus just a little bit better. So it's evolution, not revolution. How are next generation leaders moving into more significant roles? You mentioned how critical part of mid-sized firm survival is leadership transitions. Um, what's underway with that at Datner? So we, um, we do, we think we have ownership transition and leadership transition. There's a lot of overlap, but I feel like it's really important to have to have both going on. Part of what we did here a few years ago in an attempt to um, continue to have um, professional growth opportunities for more people in the office is not only did we create this non-equity associate principal level, we also created studio directors and studio resource leaders so that we had other places that people could continue to step up, um, grow, um, be leaders within the firm. And so um, things like that are really important parts of the um, of our playbook here. Um, and you know not there's no it's not a linear path necessarily. Uh, for some people it it is and you know we had we named a woman um, partner this January, uh, Gia Monero, who had been um, a studio director and an associate principal, and she's now a partner. And you know that's that's fabulous. And I'm sure that will happen again. And in other cases, people um, will be different people in those roles. And so we're trying to be very open and um, value the diversity of of experience and interest and appetite um, for leadership here, and not have it be one size fits all. What are the venues for discussions about strategic planning and development, including ESG and DEI? We, we have um, an EDI task force here that um, has a couple of the partners on it and um, also includes people from across the studios and different, um, different years of experience and years with the firm. Um, and they plug in in a lot of different ways. Part of the conversation we're having right now is should some other groups like the women's group, that we have before that, should that fall under the umbrella? With what are, how, what, what's the organization for this year? And I'm not quite sure how we're gonna, how we're gonna fall out here. We wanna make sure that we're providing opportunities for people to have discussions. We're finding ways to, feed that back into our practice and also into our projects, um, really looking at ways that we can help bring, facilitate conversations about community and demographics and who we're serving and what's gonna be the highest and best use um, for, um, for, the, for the projects that we're working on within our client groups. Sometimes that's not seen as the architect's purview. So we're 
trying to develop a, a respectful framework where we can really um, where we can really put that to the forefront of the discussion early on and continue to loop back so that it really does inform projects. Um, so we have a, we have a, we have a lot going on here in in those arenas, and we want to continue to um, you know find the right balance. Um, making sure that um, people feel respected for the time that they're spending um, being involved in things, whether it's, you know, ACE mentoring or um, you know, there's a lot of project pipeline work that's happening now. We have a really robust sustainable practice group here that we've had for years. Um, conversations about climate justice and social equity are so intertwined um, with, um, with all of our work. And so, how do we how do we have some of these conversations as individual groups, and then and then how do we intersect them? What advice might you offer to principals of firms? Uh, you mentioned earlier how like you might define mid size as twenty five to two hundred fifty. Um, I think fifty, but that's okay. Oh, 50. Okay. Well, what about what about the small firms? principals who are in the small firm um, segment, especially in New York City, that, um, you know, maybe are wondering or already on some path to growing the, on, uh, as part of the next generation of mid-sized firms. Uh, what might your advice be on how to get there? I think that one of the biggest things is um, to really have those people in, in your in your practice, in your office, that you that you trust, that you feel like you can empower, that you can you can delegate to. You just can't hold on to things too tightly, or you're not going to be able to expand and grow if that's what you want to do. Um, the other recommendation I would make is to really develop your peer network. Um, sort of like as a parent, I always feel like it was really helpful to have um, friends who had kids who are a little bit older than me because it gave me some sense of what I might be um, in for next. <laughs> what, um, so that when, when, when the kids reach that next level, I wasn't quite as surprised about, about what was happening. And I kind of think it's that way too with firms. You know, I really value having friends that are um, in leadership positions in firms that are a little bit bigger than mine. Um, it, is a, it gives me insight into some of, the, some of the things that I can start to sense might be happening here. Um, and I, I think that must be true too. If you're a 15 person firm and you know, you can um, have those candid, open, honest conversations with, um, with, with a friend, um, with a peer from who's just at, at the next scale jump. From you. Um, going back to the marketing background, marketing and business development are functions that are usually integrated into the principal at a small, you know, a small office and possibly like one of the last elements of their work that they might need to um, bring on someone full-time. Like one dimension of this could be director of operations that we see a lot. Another dimension of this is director of development, director of, um, you know, strategy or something like that. Uh, how might you just kind of like elaborate on what it takes to build the first version of that department or group in an, in an office, um, especially for a smaller firm that, that needs to find a way to, uh, you know, let go, but still have the, the, the vision intact for what the firm should they want uh, to build. And I do, I, you know, from what I've seen, it's usually around 30, you know, 25 to, to 30 people that you start meeting these, these um, folks to really specialize in something like whether, you know, accounting, marketing, um, some sort of operations role. And sometimes people play multiple, um, have, have multiple roles within one person. Um, I, I think before you bring someone on to do something, you need to be able to understand what it is that you're asking them to do. Um, we've probably all seen a lot of people who have come in as the first marketer, the first business development that a smaller mid-sized firm has ever had. And it's not successful because the, the 
aspirations, the expectations were not aligned. And it takes a long time to develop a marketing campaign. It takes a long time to bring in business, um, especially if you're looking to, to grow markets or expand you know, into, a, into a new arena. Or if you just haven't been having those conversations before and you don't, you don't have collateral, you don't have a plan. And so I think that's, you know, to really, um, I'm a huge, huge believer in the, the benefit of a peer network, you know, talk to your friends that are, that have those people, have, you know, how do they, how do they frame that? What's included in the job? What are the elements? And make sure that you're really, have expectations that are that are appropriate um, for someone first coming in, and and in, enjoy the ride, enjoy the discovery. Um, with that, I'd like to end with a favorite question of Monograph to all our guests. Um, very near and dear. It's about being human first. So aside from the business side of what we talk about, so the favorite co- closing question is: What is the kindest or nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? There, um, it's a great question. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a, a work example, um, which is really how I got into this industry after being in sales and you know design background and kind of not, not quite being sure where I belonged. And I applied for a job at a firm that doesn't exist anymore, uh, Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer Associates, and I met with Malcolm Holtzman. In retrospect, I wonder why Malcolm Holtzman was meeting with me um, for this uh, administrative position. And he was very kind to me. And he knew I was not the right person for the job. He was really looking for what I think he would call a secretary. And that was not what I wanted to do. But we had some great conversations. You could tell I really cared about architecture and knew a lot about architecture and wanted to learn more and that I was a good communicator. And he said, you know, sometimes we go after a job, we interview for the project and we don't get it. And then a couple of years later, they call us back for an even better job. And so he, I left feeling I knew I didn't get the job, which I needed. But I felt like he had, he had heard me, he had seen me, and he gave me some hope. And he passed my resume off to someone who used to work for him, who was at Mitchell Jergola, who was looking for a marketing coordinator. And that was how I got into the industry. And this is, I didn't know it, but this is the perfect place for me. And so I will always be grateful to Mr. Holtzman for being so kind to me. That's such a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and so I, th- I think um, what we'll uh, end with is just a quick little blurb about what we're doing here at Monograph and we can kind of sign off. And so architects are calling Monograph a game changer. Principals, operations leaders, and ad- office admins are using Monograph to run their oper- firm operations and manage the back office. It's designed for architects by architects specifically for small to mid-sized firms. Monograph customers are reducing their Monday morning staffing meetings and looking six months out at their billings to plan when to hire and when to bring on new projects. Seeing the future is very important. Try it out for yourself. You can start a free trial today at monograph.com or book a one-on-one demo with our team. We'll add a link to the chat. Kirsten, thank you so much for these amazing insights, your your story behind your career and like um, specifically kind of the behind the scenes about the things that you're thinking about organizationally within Datner. I think those kind of stories are really helpful for our listeners and for those that uh, visit us today. So thank you so much for your time and and for sharing. Thank thank you, George and Chris. Thanks for having me here. and, And thanks to everyone who's here today. Thanks, Chris, as always. And thanks to all of our uh, guests who came on uh, the chat here. And, and, and as always, Marjan Pearson, thank you so much for your great questions. Cheers, everyone.